But the word of God in my heart today was containment, containment. And sometimes we find ourselves in a battle of containment. And, and that's what the enemy tries to do. He tries to contain us. And, and it's, it's a battle to try to stop it. And if the enemy can do anything to us, he will try to contain us. He will try to hold us back. He will try to keep us, keep us in a box. You know, we, we, we think we're good. We think we're doing okay. But, but the, the battle to restrain us or the battle to, the, to contain us is probably, I feel like as a, even as a Christian, is the greatest fight that you'll have to fight. It's the greatest battle that you have to, to battle. There, there's a couple of things we have to watch when the enemy tries to uh, tr try to contain us. Number one, he tries to hide resources from us. He keeps his resources. Understand we got the word of God. Understand that we got a, a great church. When we, we got great people and he'll, he'll try to hide resources from us. Another thing, he'll try to distract us. Is it, is it, is it me? Is it as easy as forever to get distracted? There's so many things going on in the world today, and he'll try to get us distracted. If he can get us distracted, if he can, if he can hide resources from us. The third thing I wrote here is, is put blinders on the purpose and, and surround us with those distractors and put, put blinders on us so we don't even see outside of, of, of what God has for us. But, but all we do is blinders on the distraction which we have. And, you know, a lot of us, we, we think that we're, we're doing good and other people are not. And we think that we're, we're, we're free, but we're really not. It's just the fact that we're in bigger boxes than other people. <laughs> you know, well, I'm, I'm better than she is or I'm in a better place than he is. Well, no, your box is just bigger. And you have to watch the enemy because he'll, he'll, he'll keep you in a box. He'll just allow you to go into a bigger box. But if you're in a bigger box, have me know he's still got you constrained. He's still got his hands on you. He's still trying to, trying to hold you back. And, and so we might have bigger boxes. And, and I, one thing we have to understand about, about, about the enemy trying to constrain us and trying to contain us is that he can, he can throw everything he can at us, but he cannot stop the promise of God. He cannot stop what God has for us, and he will, so he will try to attack the promise, but he cannot stop the promise, and we cannot allow him to do that. It's always, the chips are pretty much always against the righteous, and we might as well just figure that out because there's so much enemies throwing at us, but regardless of what enemy is throwing against us, we still got to go after God with everything that we have. And whenever we do great things, you know, everything we have, you know, it's kind of like whenever we have a, a baptism and, and obviously we got, we got people who just, you know, just really focused in on God and say, you know, if, if it was a resurrection Sunday and, you know, and, and they just get caught up in the atmosphere, which is good and say, well, Christ done this for me so I can do this for him. And, and once we make a decision to go after God, then that's when the enemy comes against us with everything he has. Once we decide to be baptized, once we try to make a public declaration of what we've already made inwardly, then I'll be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not preaching gloom and doom on you. The enemy's going to come against you. See, understand this. The enemy doesn't attack you on the level of who you say you are. He attacks you on the level of who God says you are. And as long as you're being distracted, as long as you're not being, as long as you allow the resources he has for you to be hidden, and as long as you've got blinders on, I'll be honest with you, he's pretty much going to leave you alone. But once you realize, and once you begin to say, you know what, as for me and my house, we're going to have to God with everything we have. You better get ready. He's going to come after you. And so the, the chips are most of the time against the righteous. But that's a good thing because if God be for us, who can be against us? So I'm not telling us to put our head in the sand and quit and roll over and play dead. It's just the fact that that's, that's where we are. We have to go at it. It's just like David. Always, I want to talk about David a little bit here in a second. But, but whenever we see David, that's, that, whenever David come against the enemy, and when he come against the enemy, and you've heard me speak this a lot, that he'll take the stone, and the stone represented knocking out Goliath. He knocked out Goliath. He took that stone, bam, he hit him between the eyes, and down he went. And that's what happens whenever we decide because maybe it's the, it's the season, it's the time in our life or whatever God's been calling us. And we decide, you know what, this is the time to go after God. This is the time to, to forsake all and go after God with all we have. When, this is the time to be baptized. This is time we saw families getting baptized. We saw people, I mean, there's no better preaching you're going to hear this year than you hear these folks up here giving their testimony as to why they're going to be baptized. That's where it's at. And that's what happens is, and that's, that's what happens. In the Bible says we overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimonies. So the blood of the lamb is what we throw at the enemy. The blood of the lamb is a stone that hits Goliath right between the eyes and knocks him out. Amen. That's what he does. 
The Goliath is there. There's no bigger battle than what you got to deal with than David dealing with Goliath. And that's what happened. But how did you take out the enemy? How do you remove his authority from your life? You do what David does. You take, it's the word of your testimony. And every time you testify and every time you remind God and you're reminding yourself of what God has done for you, it's like getting that sword out and removing the head of Goliath. See, he didn't just knock out Goliath. He had to remove his head. And to remove the head means to remove the authority. And whenever we make a declaration and whenever we say, I'm going to serve God with all my heart, soul, might, and strength. Yeah, you, you give the enemy a blow and you knock him out and there he is. But how do you remove the authority from your life? You remove, you constantly, what is the sword? The sword is the word and you constantly taking word. You're constantly using word. I know what I used to be. I know what I couldn't do. I know what it used to be hard. I know devil, that's what I did. I know how many times I failed. But God, come on, how many got some, how many got some but God? testimonies in here today and you begin to move that and the, and see the enemy wants to contain you he wants to stop you he don't want you to remove his authority from your life and you know if he hasn't that's one of the things i want to use with david real quick here because david had to overcome a lot of things david had to overcome the inferiority placed on him from other people in first samuel chapter number six verse seven we realize that that if you, you go home and read it, but you see it. But David was the youngest, um, and, and uh, of the of the three oldest that followed Saul. Saul. There was people who followed Saul. I'm going to go through and read the scripture. But but David, we realized, was the one that when when everybody was called to the to the lineup, David wasn't even invited. And you have to be able to overcome the fact that when people don't see what God sees, you have to understand you are who God says you are. See, the devil has limitations, but God has no limitations. And the first thing you have to watch out because as soon as you get in that pool over there, or as soon as you give your heart to the Lord, as soon as you raise that hand, or as soon as you make that declaration, you have to watch it because the first person that's going to make you feel inferior is going to be the enemy. Not to mention everybody else. No, you got to understand, I've I, I decided I, I'm going to make it stick this time. I'm going to, I'm going to live for God for, you know, my, my family, we're going to live for God. We're going to do it. We have to understand that we got to overcome. We got to stay away from the containment and enemy trying to place of us. It's going to be placed upon us. When they had the lineup of King, David was not even in the lineup. You better be secure for who you are because when everybody else is looking somewhere else, you better make sure that you know who you are. I mean, there's a lot of times everybody else is looking somewhere else. But you're standing there and says, I know whom God has called me to be and what God has called me to be. See, the difference between Saul and the difference between David was that Saul, and the reason why Samuel went and called Saul, I mean called David, was because Saul had a problem inside him. He had an internal insecurity. See, Saul had this internal insecurity, and that's, that's, a, that's the way that the enemy will, will try to contain you, is have you become in, uh, internal insecurity. Saul had an internal insecurity, so the David who was coming to help him, because Saul had this internal insecurity, he thought David was coming to take his place. Honey, when you're in the right place with God, you're not worried about somebody coming and taking your place. All you, all you see when people come to surround themselves with, you come and see people coming to help you and prop you up. See, that's a tap root. The, the, the tap root is the, is the inner, the fruit is the outer. And you have to be careful what the outer is. You have to be careful what the fruit is. And, and the fruit can look good, but it's that tap root on the inside of you that will take you out. And Saul had this internal insecurity on who he was. And the reason why he had this internal insecurity on who he was is because he had this internal insecurity in who God was. You always have to realize who God is. And regardless of how many times you failed and regardless how hard it is for you to do something, you have to make sure that you don't have an internal insecurity. You got to make sure you have an internal security. I am secure in who God is. I am secure in who I am. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I got it figured out. I'm not saying I know how to do everything, but I am secure in who God is. My inner is not insecure. My inner is secure. Regardless of if everybody else is looking somewhere else, I know that God is looking right straight at me. And the enemy will contain you. He will hold you back because of the inner insecurity which you have. And we have to make sure we realize that, that we know that, that, that we're not here just to be caught up in who people say we are. We're caught up in who God says we are. See, Jesus didn't come to do the will of men. Jesus come to do the will of his Father. 
Thank you. All eight of them. Let me do it again. I said, Jesus didn't come to do the will of everybody. He just come to do the will of his father. Whether people like it or not, he says, I've come to do what God's called me to do. I've come to do what the father's called me to do. Because if the father has called me to do it, then he'll give me everything I need to do what it is I need to do. We want, we want the praise and admiration of everybody else, and we don't even look to God. If God is on your side, if God be for us, who can be against us, right? And that's what we have to look at. Jesus didn't come to do that. He, salvation came because of the will of the Father, and Jesus came to do the will of the Father. He didn't come to, that was, he had so much internal security that he didn't have to look anywhere else. If God has called you into something, then you don't have to worry about anything else because God has called you into something. God has called you. That's that inner security. I'm a pastor. If I was standing for a group of pastors today because it's kind of people relate a little bit better, well, pastor, you're called. And that's the reason why you can do what you can do. Well, you have to understand, I say it all the time, I'm a man from men for men. I'm a person that was chosen from people to be before people. That's the only difference between me and you. I'm a guy that was called from a bunch of people to stand in front of you. But all of us are called. I'm just called to do this. I just told you last week, we lined 60 people up here and I put a microphone in front of them and every single one of them began to preach. You don't have to have a church. You don't have to have a pulpit. Somebody's got to have a church and somebody's got a pulpit, but we all got a calling. And if God has called us, then we realize that we have this inner security. And how do you know I'm called? Because if you're a born again child of God, you answered the call. Because you don't come and knock on his door and say, Jesus, today is the day I want to get saved. The day you got saved is the day that you got tired of him knocking at your door and you open the door, he came in. He chose you, you didn't choose him. And once he chooses you and you answer the call, it opens the door to impossibilities. You see the, you see the security in that. Well, now that I have answered a call and now I realize that this is what God has called us to do, then, then we realize that God has called us and it opens the door to the impossibilities that we can have. In Matthew 14, 28. In Matthew 14, 28, we know the story. We learned it in Sunday school if you went to Sunday school. That Peter, the Bible says that Peter was in the boat with his, with, his, with his friends. And we know the story how they looked and they saw Jesus was walking on the water. And Peter answered him and said, After, go back to verse 27, Matthew 14, 27. But immediately spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. Stop right there. Here's the battle of being internally secure. And the way you're internally secure is the enemy cannot contain you unless you're internally insecure. If you're internally secure, you're secure in who you are, who God says you are. And even in times of fright, even in the times of anxiety, even in times of fear or struggle or whatever we're dealing with, Jesus is so good is he'll give a word of faith and right in the middle of everything, Jesus speaks to them and he says, be a good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Why did he say that when they're on this ocean, they're out there and the, and the waves are rocking and they see what they think is a ghost out there on the water and they look out there and Peter's looking out and everybody says it's a ghost and, and, and Jesus says these words to calm us down. Don't worry, it's just me. And if you don't have, if you have an internal insecurity, be like, it can't be God. It's God. I'm, I'm here to get out. Oh my goodness, it's going to take me under. Oh my goodness, this sickness is going to take me under. Oh my goodness, this rebellion in my family is going to take us out. Oh my goodness, this problem in my finances, we're never going to overcome it. Honey, that is internal insecurity and the enemy has you contained in the box because you're more worried about what's happening on the outside than what's on the inside. And then we have to realize that, wait a minute, God has called me. And so he says, look at this. He says, it is I, do not be afraid. Verse 28. In verse 28, whenever he, he says it is I, and Peter answers him and says, Lord, if it's you, allow me, command me to come to you on the water. And then we know what the verse, verse 29 says. Well, verse 29, go to verse 29. And he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to Jesus. 
Why did Peter, this drives us crazy, why did G Peter walk on the water? Because Jesus called him. Sure, we all might not ever walk on the water, but quit wanting everybody else's miracle. Where your miracle is going to be bigger than, than Peter's miracle. Why? Because it's yours. I don't know why, but Peter needed to walk on water that day. And the people needed Peter to walk on water that day. I don't know what it is that you need for God to do to you, but let me tell you something. If you answer the call that Jesus calls for you, it opens the door to the impossible to your life. And you can do what you never could do before. And that's what makes you secure in who God is. He just began to walk on water. And let me, let me remind you of this. Flesh cannot hold up water. Go to the waterway this afternoon and try it. You're going to sink to the bottom. So what held Peter up? His faith. His security. He wasn't contained. And he began to get out of the boat. And his, and his, and his friends were saying, don't get out of the boat. Stay contained. Stay where you are. You're a good guy. You're a disciple. You're, you're a follower of Jesus. But Jesus is calling us to do something completely more. We understand what we can do, but what are the things that God wants us to do that we cannot believe that we can do? And whenever we answer the call, whenever we get it, we don't stay content. And they got out of the boat. Highest praise is a church that will not stay in the boat. We realize the call that God has called us to do. We realize who he's called us to be. And God, if you call me, if you tell me to do it, then bless God, even though it don't make any sense whatsoever, we're getting up out of the boat. You got to hear the call. I said you got to hear the call. One of the things I was thinking about today is that we got to hear what God is saying. Like never before, we need to hear what the voice of God is saying. You wake up. Got home, had a, had a busy weekend. Got home late last night <clears throat> doing ministry and, and sit down and had no idea. Just began to just call on the TV and, and there's Iran shooting missiles over to, to Israel. This is the time to hear from God. Honey, if you get on, if, if you get on, if you get on social media, you you probably went outside and dug your head in a hole, put your, dug a hole and put your head in it and say, oh, well, it's me. But you better make sure you're hearing from God right now. And whenever, how did Peter know that it was Jesus that called him up on the water? Because he knew the voice of Jesus. And and the one thing that we have to understand that whenever we're walking in peace and we're walking with understanding is that. Right now in 2024, what's going on in the world today? Everybody's going to, oh, it's, it's Gog and Magog. Some people know just enough about the Bible to be dangerous. To make it sound like the people who don't know a whole lot sound, well, this guy knows a whole lot because they're saying words like Gog and Magog. <laughs> this is the end time. This is it. How am I getting? Oh, my goodness, we just stop. I'll be honest with you, church. If it is the beginning of Gog and Magog, I don't care. What are we going to do? We get ready to leave this earth. <laughs> the Bible says in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. And if it is, I can't stop it. If it's not, I can't worry about it. But if it is, all I know is, is I'm getting ready to be raptured. We're getting ready to get sucked out of here. And, I'm all, and if you don't believe that, I can, I, I, there's nothing I can do about it other than just tell you that it's going to just know him. And we have to make sure that we know his voice. You say, well, how do I know his voice? The one thing that, one thing I, I want to make sure, I, all during the years of being over here and, and, and pastor, talking about I was called to, to pastor this church, and one thing I want to make sure I do is, is know God's voice. And we say, well, we don't know God's voice, the enemy. How do we know if it's the enemy? How do we know it's God? That's one of the biggest things. Let me tell you something. If you want to know if it's enemy that's talking to you, if you want to know if it's God talking to you, quit looking on the outside and look on the inside. Now, follow me here. 
Whenever God tells me to do something around here, whenever God, if it has to do with financial, it has to do with buying land or building a building or, 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 or hiring somebody or doing anything that might put this ministry into jeopardy or, or decisions that we have to make, even, even having to do with pulpit ministry or whatever it is, having to do with my family, and, and I got a decision, and the enemy is talking in one ear and, and God is talking in the other, then, and I had to discern which one it is, then I begin, and I don't know which one it is, and then if I do hear a voice, I want to make sure it's God. You know what I check? I don't check the enemy because I know who he is. I don't check God because I know who he is. I check myself. And I answer, ask myself, am I in the right place? Am I doing everything I'm supposed to be doing? Am I really living a life obedient to God? I didn't say I won't be a Christian anymore and I'm on my way to heaven, but am I in the place where God would have me to be? And when I know I'm in the place where God has me to be, then it's separation. I can discern the voice of the enemy from the voice of God, and I know what God is telling me to do. Now, let me help you some more. Adam, in the book of Genesis, was walking around, and the Bible says before the fall, he said he could hear God walking in the cool of the day. I mean, he's up there, he's talking to you know, y'all know, know my, my phrase. It's, this is my story because this is my church, so I get to tell my story. So in my story, in my church, Adam, he nobody else to talk to. And so he's talking to giraffe and he's talking to elephant. I mean, who is he going to talk to? I mean, he's over talking to the devil, so he's over here talking to giraffe and an elephant. It's my story. And here's elephant, who's, here's, here's giraffe's got the big long neck and see everything. Here's elephant can make a way to see everything in my story. And, but Adam says, there's God. And giraffe's saying, I don't see him. No, it's God. Elephant says, well, I can, I'm just knocking down some trees here, but I don't see him. No, it's God. Who comes around the corner? God. Because he knew it was him. Why? Because he was living in a place of innocence. He was living in a place of obedience. But watch this. After the fall, after the fall, him and Eve now are walking around and he hears the same voice. And he heard God coming, walking in the cold today. This time, he took off and he ran and he hid. God shows up. It was God. It wasn't elephant. It wasn't giraffe. It was God. Adam, where are you? I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? Because I'm naked. I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Verse 11. Who told you that you were naked? Whose voice are you listening to now? When you were living in obedience and living righteously, the devil was still talking, but you didn't hear him, but you only heard me. Now that you're walking into disobedience, not only do you hear my voice, but you also hear the enemy's voice. And the problem is, is you can't discern the difference. And the problem with most church people is that we don't know where we are. We come to church and pat ourselves on the back, but I'll be honest with you, we still hear the enemy's voice and we still hear God's voice and we can't discern the difference. That is a I hate to use the word scary, but that's a scary time for the church when you stand there like an old cow looking at a new gate and can't tell, is this God or is this the enemy? Is God telling me I'm naked and I need to hide or is that the enemy? Or is it God speaking? You have to get it right. You have to hear it. Oh, preacher, please preach a series on it so we can get it. How about me just telling you this today because we got other stuff we need to teach. Make sure you're in the right place. Proper people placement is the most important place in God you can ever be.
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, and he placed some in the church. You know why you're here? Because you were placed here. No, I was going down the road and I went by and the church was even there. I looked at her and there it was. Honey, you want to go to the church? Sure. It was a setup. Sounds just like you, didn't it? Well, see, pastor is my car. Pastor's big brother, like Alexis and Siri, he hears everything. I mean, what? You can believe it if you want to. You're here because God placed you here. And you're in the right place. Oh, I can pastor. We can run school ministries and we can do all kinds of stuff. And I can still be out of place. So whenever I'm hearing something, I hear a voice and the enemy saying, don't do this. And God is saying, do that. I check. I can't tell the voice is down the same. I check myself. Am I in the right place with God? Am I praying like I ought to? Am I allowing things in my door like I used to? You got three gates. Your eye gate, your ear gate, and your mouth gate. Am I allowing the right things in my eyes? Am I allowing the right things in my ears? Am I allowing the right things come out of my mouth? Because that's the only three access that the enemy has to your temple. Yes, yes, yes. That I know it's you, God. And then a peace that surpasses all understanding comes over you. And it makes absolutely any sense. But then God has called you to do something and you do it. You do it because you know it's going to open the door to impossibilities. And if you don't do it, you can't do it. Thank God for the iron dome that was over Israel last night. Thank God for the warnings that they'd be able to say, get into your shelters. We don't live a life like that over here in America, but Israel has to live that way. Not in the physical, but in the spiritual. Make sure you're living a life that there's an iron dome over you at all times. Who's the iron dome in the spiritual? It's the Holy Spirit of God. And the enemy is always shooting scuzz. He's after your marriage. He's after your children. He's after your finances. He's after your joy. He's after your peace. And you don't even realize, but because you're a worshiper of God and because you love the Lord, there's an iron dome over you. And it's not backed by the IDF and the the United States of America. It's backed by the Holy Spirit of God. And he says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every time it rise up against you and judge what thou shalt condemn, you got to understand who's over you this morning. Well, you worried, preacher. What are we going to do? Make sure we're in the proper people place. Make sure we're in the right place. Make sure I'm in the right place. I'm in the right place, God. See, anybody can praise God. Anybody can praise Him. So you're going to hear the voices. You're going to hear the voices. The voice is always going to be there. You're going to hear from God. I, I, now, you hear too many voices when you go get help, but I mean, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but in the spiritual realm, you hear God. And you hear the enemy because he's going to throw his two cents worse in there. Understand this about the, the, the words of the Lord and the words of the enemy. The enemy always comes to condemn. The Lord always comes to convict. And when you're in the right place, you better watch it. Two are very close. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. Condemnation comes from the enemy. Condemnation says, oh my. Oh my word. This is the beginning of the end. You're going down. You have no way out. I got you in a box. You've done it now. You didn't live where you thought you were going to live. And now I got you. And the Holy Spirit, he'll use the same things, but in a different way. Yep, you struggled. You slipped. And you fell in a bad place. But I come to you might have life and have it more abundantly. See, conviction says, he convinces you that you are in trouble and you need a Savior. Condemnation says you're in trouble and there's no hope. You dig yourself, you're in quicksand, and every time you move, you're going farther and farther. That's the enemy. God uses the exact same evidence, but gives you a hand and says, take my hand, take my hand, take my hand, take my hand. Keep looking for 
for the hand. Next thing, I'm just coming up with this now. I'm kind of stopped at number one. I feel like we need to, we need to do this this morning. Jesus says that if you don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. What does that, what does that mean? Right? It means a whole lot, but on the surface, it means anybody can praise him. A basketball player that scored 42 points in a game, he gets started sticking my phone in front of himself. I want to thank God. Put a round ball and a round hoop. Glory. He must know Jesus. It makes us feel good. I'm not saying they're not saved, not gonna love the Lord with all their heart, but I'll be honest with you, anybody can praise the Lord. But only when you're consumed with his awesomeness can you worship him. Now follow me, I'm gonna take you somewhere. I can praise him for what he's done. I can praise him for what he's doing. I can praise him for the testimonies. I can praise him just for the things I can see and the things that I know. Anybody can do that. But to worship him is because I am completely enamored with who he is. And nothing else can satisfy him at all. worship him because there's nothing like him you put him on a level with everything else and so you praise him because it makes you happy it makes you joyful there's nothing wrong with praise praise brings you to worship but we stop at the gate of worship stay with me now I didn't forget what I was teaching here Praise takes you to the gate of worship. But then worship gets us. It's the outer court, inner court, most holy place. Outer court is thanksgiving. Inner court is praise. And we stand there. And then we stand at the gate of inner court. And on the inside of the veil is the cloud, the glory of God, where there is majesty, where there is glory, where there is splendor. And we're at all in what we see. And that throws us to our knees. And we begin to worship Him. We worship Him because He's holy. We worship him because there's not anything like him. You can search everything and it's not like him. Come on guys, it's worship. It's not just a song. It's, it's, it's not a people. It's him. I've never seen anything like him experience anything like you. You're more powerful and more holy than everything. You're more powerful and holy than anything. You're holy. That's what the angel says. You're holy. You're holy. 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 You're separate than anything I've ever seen before. And that's what true worship is. It's separation. To be holy means to be separate. Come on, watch me. And when you get in that place of worship, when you get in that place of understanding that praise led me to the door of worship and I walk through the, the veil and, and I'm in that place of worship and I worship Him because He's separate than my job. He's separate than my family. He's separate than my problems. He's separate than my circumstances. There's, he's not like anything. He's not like everything. He's separate. And because he is holy. And whenever you start worship him that way, watch this. Because he's holy, because he's separate, he makes you holy. said when you get to that point of worshiping him because he's holy he makes you holy the bible says be ye holy even as he is holy does that mean living right me read my bible we try so hard i gotta come to church i gotta get baptized i gotta, I gotta keep the nursery i gotta do this thing i think you gotta do nothing to 
just realize that he's holy. He's separate. There's none like unto him. No, not even one. There's nothing to compare you to, God. You are the healer. You are the restorer. You are my strength. You are my song. You are my glory. God, you are my future. You are my past. You are, there's none like unto you, God. There's nothing. You can't give me houses. You can't give me boats. You can't give me people. You can't give me nothing, God. There's none like unto you, God. It is you, God. You are holy. You are awesome. You are glorious. You are in this place. And you rule and you reign over all things, God. You are holy. any stage, before I stand before any people, before I'm having to meet with, if it's a banker, if it's a, a family, if it's just whatever it is, God, I can't do this. But with you, I can do all things. That's my simple prayer. I'm sitting around, what's Pastor thinking? What are you saying? Sometimes before I grab this microphone, God, I cannot do this. I've done it thousands of times, but I can't do this with you. I can do all things. I can run through that wall. I can jump over that mountain. I can I can walk on water. We can the impossible can take place. So anybody wants to contain us wants to hold us down. But I'm telling you, with everything going in the world today, we gotta hear from God. If you want to hear from God, you better make you gotta make him separate. 
He's not like the enemy. The enemy's not even on the same level. He's not even in the same class. And we're listening to the enemy's voice and we're listening to God's voice and we can't discern the difference and we're buying books and we're going to this and everything else. But really all we need to do is get in a room, shut the door and say what we just did while ago. And the reason why I can do that in public is because I do that in private. Well, four of you got it. I just poured my heart out. I said, you do things in public because you do it in private. You know how to get in your car before you, you press that button to start the car and put the key in there and you just stop and say, wow, you're a big deal, God. You're glorious. You're majesty. You're magnificent. You're separate than anything. You're other than anything that will stand in my way today. And nothing is impossible for you. So let's do this day today. Amen. And every voice that begins to talk to you, I'm telling you, you're going to be able to discern which it is. Because to be holy, listen to this, I got to finish it. Because to be holy is to be separate. And the reason why you can't separate the voices is because you yourself are not separated. But when you see him as holy, he makes you holy, then you're separate. And whatever box the enemy's trying to put you in, it doesn't fit. Get ready for the box that he's been keeping you in all during the last week because today's the first day of this week. It won't fit anymore. Wonder why? Because you realize that he is holy. Therefore, you are holy. That means he is separate. And therefore, you are separate. You can't be like everybody else and expect to hear God's voice differently. We're separate, so we hear God's voice different. Amen. Well, give God a praise and glory in this house today. Amen. I want to sing it. Come on, sing a chorus or something. Come on, let's go. Let's sing one time. is happening in the earth today. We thank you, Lord, that we're being separated because we know he who separates us. We are being made holy because we know who is holy. Father, you are holy. You are separate and you are other than anything we've ever seen or acknowledged before. And as, as we acknowledge you as the holy separate one, God, you acknowledge us as the holy and separate one. Make us holy, Lord. Make us separate. We give you our life. We give you our dreams. We give you our future. With everything that we have in our life, God, we just give it to you, Lord. And God, we pray for revival. Because nothing else fits. Nothing else fits. We tried everything else. The only thing that fits the hour in which we're living is a sovereign, mighty move of your spirit. Move upon us today, Lord. 
Move upon this nation. Move upon Israel, God. Move upon the people of this world, Lord. And may they see you as we know you, Lord, as separate and other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining us today. We are so glad to connect with you. If you are new to HP and want to get more involved, I invite you to text 910-501-2005. Or you can download our church app and stay up to date on everything going on around here. I also want to tell you three ways you can give today. You can give through text. Text any amount to 84321. If you've never set that up, it only takes a moment. You can give right through your phone at any time. Second, you can give online through our website. Go to highestpraisechurch.com and click the giving tab. You can give right there online. Finally, you can give through mail. You can send in your gift to P.O. Box 1189, Shalote, North Carolina, 28459. And if you're looking for a way to plug in, to serve, or be a part of what's going on here at Highest Praise, join us for our next step class. It's the first Sunday of every month at 9 a.m. We are so glad you joined us today. God is not done with your life. If you need prayer, have any questions, you can reach us through social media or you can call our office at 910-754-4809. We love you, Highest Praise, and the best is now.